Okay, video lecture five uh, for the makeup for September 21st. Uh, we switched over to PowerPoint five here, and we're starting part E of the book. Um, and that uh, begins with the Simon versus Kennebunkport case on page 179. Now this case illustrates the idea of the admissibility of what is called similar happenings evidence in tort cases. This is not covered by a specific rule of evidence, but it is still a relevance issue. So the classic case here involves a personal injury plaintiff seeking to introduce evidence of similar accidents involving the defendant's property or product. The basic points to keep in mind here are pretty simple. Evidence of similar accidents or incidents is relevant and may be admissible if the conditions under which the other accident or incidents occurred were sufficiently similar to the one at issue in the case. With something like the classic slip and fall torts case, substantial similarity is usually going to include an analysis of the environmental conditions at the time of the accident, as in, you know, is the sidewalk dangerous when it's dry or only when it's wet due to rain and so forth. So if you see something like this, make sure you pay attention to the issue of environmental conditions, if they might come into play, and look for similar happenings that in fact happened under similar environmental conditions. That would definitely be something to discuss on an exam. Now the other happenings evidence can be relevant to one or both of these two purposes. First, obviously to show causation, right? Other similar happenings make it more likely that the prior accidents were caused by the same defect. And number two, the evidence can be relevant to whether the property owner or manufacturer of a product had notice, notice of a possible defect. So as a general rule, this issue of similarity of accidents or incidents will be most strictly applied in the first context. Courts will probably be stricter about similarity if it's being offered uh, to prove causation than just to prove someone had noticed that a product or condition might be unsafe. This kind of makes sense from a policy point of view to show that the same defect or set of defects caused the prior event as well as the actual incident at issue in the case, you'd want a lot of similarity. But you can imagine a property owner or product manufacturer getting a lot of reports of accidents or mishaps with a particular sidewalk or product. And even if those incidents differed from one another, they still contribute to the defendant's overall knowledge and notice that there's a problem with that sidewalk or product. Still though, I'm not saying that completely different incidents will be admitted. Uh, there still is the requirement of similarity with regard to notice. Uh, but again, if leeway is gonna be given there on the similarity requirements, it's more likely to happen if the prior accidents are proffered to show notice of a problem. Now, of course, sometimes the situation is reversed and a defendant in a tort case wants to offer evidence that no other incidents or accidents have happened in the way the plaintiff is claiming, even though conditions have been unchanged for a significant period of time under the same conditions as the, as the plaintiff is claiming. And most jurisdictions allow that as well. Okay, so two more things to remember here. First, I've already told you that this is really a relevance issue, right? If the similar accidents or happenings aren't really similar enough, they would be considered irrelevant and inadmissible. So there's going to be this threshold determination of similarity to determine relevance. Now that begs the question, wait a minute, shouldn't this then be a 104B conditional relevance determination by the judge? Uh, because if it's if it's, you know, if it didn't happen, if it's not similar enough, it's irrelevant. Uh, shouldn't the evidence therefore be admitted as long as a reasonable jury could find the events similar uh, enough to be considered? Well, the answer to that question is on the slide, uh, and it is no. Even though most conditional relevancy issues are determined under the Rule 104B type scheme, for policy reasons, this admissibility determination of similar happenings evidence 
has been given to judges. So judges have to determine whether the incidents or accidents are similar enough to be relevant to a preponderance of the evidence before admitting evidence about them. So obviously one concern might be that allowing the jurors to determine whether the happenings should be believed and therefore made a part of their deliberations might end up requiring many trials within trials which would be obviously very distracting and potentially confusing to juries about exactly you know what they're trying to decide in the case but the bigger more important concern is that the evidence of other accidents in areas under the defendant's control might cause the jury to lose interest in the issues growing out of the incident or accident in the case at hand and simply find against the defendant because say a lot of people have been hurt on her property uh, or have been hurt by her device. So judges are the ones who make these determinations of admissibility of similar act evidence using that 104A scheme. And of course, lastly, don't forget that 403 umbrella. Evidence like this is always subject to 403 balancing. So evidence that might qualify as substantially similar might still be kept out if a judge determines the probative value is substantially outweighed by a 403 concern. Okay, now getting back to the rules, the next four rules we're going to look at, rule 407 through 411, have one important thing in common, and that is that policy concerns led the rule drafters to take these specific types of evidence and categorically decide that the evidence should not be admissible. Because if you think about each one of these, it is conceivable that these determinations could have been made by just applying Rule 403 on a case-by-case -case basis. But instead, essentially the 403 balancing has been done in advance, right? The potential prejudice, distraction, or confusion inherent in these categories of evidence has just been deemed to substantially outweigh the probative value of the evidence. So the five types of evidence covered by these rules uh, 407 through 411 are subsequent remedial measures, settlement negotiations, payment of medical expenses, plea bargaining, and liability insurance. So I said that policy considerations led to this categorical approach in keeping out these categories of evidence. One policy concern I already mentioned, which is that the evidence covered by these rules tends to be particularly unfairly prejudicial, while at the same time often not being highly probative. And the other one is discussed in your reading, the idea that these rules promote activities that we want to encourage in society because they contribute to a safer world or because they encourage some other socially valuable or efficacious activity like encouraging people to settle lawsuits or encouraging people to buy liability insurance. So these rules were designed to protect people who engage in these kinds of socially valuable activities from suffering some prejudice if evidence of those activities were to be admitted against them in court. And the last thing to note here is that some of this evidence that otherwise would be excluded under these rules might still be admissible if it's offered for another purpose, not the purpose mentioned in the rule as triggering automatic exclusion. Now, I say might be admissible because if evidence does fit into one of these potentially permissible purposes, then it still has to undergo Rule 403 scrutiny to be admitted. And we're going to see examples of this as we discuss each rule. So um, you don't have to worry about it quite yet because I'll be giving you some examples. Okay, so the first rule is Rule 407, uh, which is entitled Subsequent Precautions. And uh, Rule 407 is right here on the slide. So the term subsequent precautions, uh, which is the heading in your casebook, uh, refers to corrections that are made or precautions that are taken by a party after an accident, after an accident. But the title of the rule is subsequent remedial measures, and that's the terminology that I've most commonly heard. All right, so what does the rule say? When measures are taken that would have made an earlier injury or harm less likely to occur, evidence of the subsequent measures is not admissible to prove, 
It's not admissible to prove any of these four things. Negligence, culpable conduct, a defect in a product or its design, or a need for warning or instruction. So these are the four forbidden purposes under the rule. Evidence of these measures taken after an injury or some harm being done are not admissible if they are proffered to prove any of these four things. But the rule then goes on to say, but the court may admit this evidence for another purpose, such as impeachment, or if it's disputed, providing ownership, control, or the feasibility of precautionary measures. Sorry, it's not providing, it's proving. Proving ownership, control, or the feasibility of precautionary measures. All right, so I have the asterisk on the slide by the word may. This is a great hint that, of course, Rule 403 balancing will come into play if evidence is potentially admissible for one of these other purposes. And we're going to talk about those in detail. Okay, so the majority of states have adopted rules based on federal Rule 407, and even state states that don't have uh, specific evidence codes uh, that do follow the same basic policy. Uh, although some jurisdictions like California leave out these last two forbidden purposes up on the slide uh, and subsequent uh, measures are admissible in strict liability cases uh, for defects or warnings. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in a second uh, because uh, California is one of those states. Okay. So Rule 407, which categorically excludes evidence that a party has taken measures after an accident to make a location or process or product safer, if that evidence is offered to help prove negligence in regard to the accident, any kind of culpability, or to show a product defect or need for a warning, okay? But subject to 403 balancing, a court may admit evidence of subsequent remedial measures for an alternate purpose when certain facts exist and when certain defenses are raised. So for impeachment or to prove ownership, control or feasibility of taking precautionary measures if one or more of those is in fact denied by the defendant. So the exceptions here uh, usually come about because of some defense that's offered by a defendant. Okay, just some basics about the rule. First, don't forget that even though the subsequent remedial measure rule usually involves some sort of physical repair, that's the common thing, it can also apply to keep out of evidence any remedial measure that would have made the accident or incident less likely to occur. Um, for example, firing a careless employee, uh, changing a manufacturing process or the design of a product, uh, maybe instituting additional training of employees, uh, issuing a product recall letter, or even a hospital changing its policy like we saw in the tour case in the reading. And here's a really interesting one. This rule can apply as well when a defendant is being sued for breach of duty to the plaintiff, even when the underlying claim is caused not by an accident, but by an intentional tort. Okay, and I have a couple of examples of, of, of what I mean by that on the slide. How about uh, an example where senior management requires a mid-level manager who's been accused of sexual harassment to attend sensitivity training, right? Or how about a grocery chain that installs uh, new, much brighter lights uh, in a parking lot after a mugging occurs. Now, both of those are remedial measures taken after an event that caused damage, but these events actually weren't accidents, right? The mid-level manager purposely engaged in the harassing behavior, and the mugger purposely robbed a person in the parking lot, right? So not accidents, but of course, both were arguably dangerous situations that were worthy of correcting once the defendants had notice. And of course, we want people to engage in this kind of corrective action. So here again, in a breach of duty suit against the company in the first example and against the grocery chain in the second, evidence of these remedial measures would not be admissible to show that breach of duty.
Okay, so this is not a relevance issue usually, right? These kinds of corrections or precautions seem to be at least somewhat relevant and probative and maybe, depending on the case, in fact, really probative, really relevant, probative of negligence on the part of the party making the repair. So usually the threshold basic relevance connection, absolutely clear here. But of course, like I said, there's been this strong policy consideration against admitting this evidence because we want people to make improvements or repairs and so on. So the argument continues is that, in fact, making this kind of evidence admissible against defendants would be discouraging them from eliminating sources of danger to others in, or, you know, in their property or products or instrumentalities. Now you saw in the book, I think, a pretty good argument in footnote eight in the tour case, that in fact, an absence of this rule would not necessarily dissuade people from taking post-accident safety measures. I mean, uh, this social policy argument does have some critics. Uh, a lot of people think that safety measures would still be taken even without the rule, uh, if only logically to prevent further liability, further incidents. Um, I do have on the slide though that that secondary purpose that's often mentioned in relation to the rule, which is simply that this kind of evidence is not that relevant, or if it is relevant, it has low probative value. Obviously, that conflicts with the main heading on this slide, that the evidence is often very probative and relevant. I mean, even if one wants to argue that, oh, sure, there could be many possible reasons for making repairs or improvements, um, so that we can't be sure uh, that's what motivated the particular subsequent action. I think common sense still tells us that at least one motivation behind an improvement, say of a stairway or a sidewalk after an accident, was the defendant's belief that the stairs or sidewalks uh, wasn't really safe at the time of the accident in question. Um, so that's uh, relevance. Now here's an interesting question with regard to the rule, and it was controversial and unclear when the rule was first put in place until it was cleared up back in 1997. What about in, say, a products liability action? Uh, let's say a manufacturer takes measures to change a product's design after a product is manufactured, but before the event at issue in a case. Okay, so I have a classic example of this on the slide. Suppose a plaintiff is injured in a car accident and brings a product liability action against the automobile's manufacturer alleging defective design of the braking system. Okay, now the plaintiff finds out that after the time she bought her year and model of the car, but before her accident, the defendants altered the design of its braking system in a way that would have in fact prevented her accident. So she argues, hey, this exclusionary rule shouldn't apply here because the event at issue was my accident and this design change was made before my accident and not subsequent to it. So the question is, what do you think? Should this measure be admissible in her case. Maybe stop this uh, video and think about it uh, for a second. Uh, because wouldn't excluding this go along with the first purpose on the other slide, encouraging product manufacturers to make continuous improvements in safety? Well, courts were confused about this too. There was a split in the circuits on this issue, but it was resolved in 1997 with an amendment that gave us the current language in the rule. Okay, um, I have the rule uh, underlined uh, on the next slide. Uh, measures that are covered by the rule, in fact, have to take place after the injury at hand. See, an earlier injury. Uh, and, you know, I'm thinking that this is actually why, um, I think anyway, there seems to be an increase in recall notices and warnings about this kind of thing. Okay, uh, so I have a California alert slide here. The California evidence code on this issue is section 1151. 1151, and you can see here by its language that it covers only evidence being used to show negligence or culpable conduct. But unlike the federal rule, there's no reference to use of evidence of subsequent measures 
going to prove product defects or design defects or the need for warning. So evidence is inadmissible if it's being used to show negligence or culpable conduct by a defendant, but this whole language from the federal rule about product design or defect or warnings is missing from the California rule. Okay, so these two uses of the federal rule really go only to strict liability actions in product liability cases. And the California Supreme Court has decided that our rule 1151 doesn't apply to strict liability actions in our state, uh, even though the language you know, is in there about culpable conduct. The court's reasoning here was that it didn't make sense to believe that a product manufacturer would somehow forego making improvements to a product just because an improvement could be used against it, given that the manufacturer would be risking more and more accidents without the improvements being made and more and more potential liability. So the California Supreme Court therefore said that the policy reason of encouraging repairs just didn't logically apply to mass manufacturers. So another difference between the federal rule and the California rule. And that is the end of this video.